And also before we get begin, uh, just a short disclaimer uh, saying that all this information is presented um, in good faith. And now on to the main event, uh, Dr. Charlie Hall, who has been with us uh, several times over the last couple of years. Uh, he's a professor and Ellison Chair in uh, International Foreign Culture at Texas A&M University. And with that, Charlie, I'm gonna go ahead and make you the presenter and you can take it away. All right, folks. Kyle, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, this is several years in a row that I've done this webinar in conjunction with, of course, the Economic Forecast that's published by Farm Credit East. So I appreciate uh, these guys uh, taking the bull by the horns and providing this service to the industry in terms of uh, what the outlook looks like for the year. And of course, as with any crystal balls, some of the crystal balls are fuzzier than others. And it's all because of some things are, are fairly clear, but others are not. And I'll get to those here in a second. So let's talk about, um, go down to the slide. Okay. I really want to start with how has the green industry performed recently, right? And let's set the stage for where we're going uh, for this year. Now, if we think back in terms of when the, the pandemic started, we thought, oh man, this is Armageddon because everybody was closed. Nobody was deemed essential except for Walmart and, uh, and some of the other uh, Lowe's and Home Depot and, and uh, medical facility, first responders, et cetera. But then ultimately the green industry, we were deemed to be essential and as we should have been in the first place. And our performance was surprisingly good during the pandemic. And in fact, surprisingly stellar during the pandemic. And one of the things that was, um, uh, rather curious about that is is that in 2021 particularly the weather was really working in our favor across the country and because of that 2021 if you look across the grower sector the uh, landscape sector and the, the retail garden center sector just basically the retail sector including box stores 2021 is the best year ever in the green industry I mean I, I've, I grew up in the industry and all of my academic career from graduate student all the way to 34 years in academia now as a professor and and i've never seen a, a year in which top line growth was so good and bottom line net profits were good right so 2021 was kind of a banner year well we were poised for 2022 because of the 18 and a half to 20 million new gardeners slash landscapers that found their way to our industry during the pandemic. We were poised for a really great spring in, uh, in all of 2022, but mother nature didn't cooperate. And I've got a, a map that I, I didn't include this time because I showed it last year. And it just shows how destructive um, that the weather patterns, weather patterns were to our industry in 2022. Now, that being said, there were some folks that did well because the weather cooperated in their trade area. So even though I'm taking a look at national trends and reporting a number of the numbers from my Your Market Metrics benchmarking program, <clears throat> which is industry data that I collect from uh, the, at the grower level from firms that represent about $3 billion worth of sales in the industry. So all this data, and, and we're collecting retail data at the same time in the same benchmarking program, and, and all of that was um, rather mixed in 22, depending on where you were. So while top line sales in 2022 were favorable in that um, uh, they were one and a half percent higher than what they were in 2021 at the grower level, they were still down at the retail level a little bit. But bottom line net profits for our growers were down 43% uh, in the first six months of, of 2022. Now, some of them made it up in the latter half of 2022, and I'm analyzing that data as we speak. So I don't have the, how, I don't have the data on how uh, the growers ended up 2022. But for retailers, Retail Garden Center, <clears throat> the data that we have show that both the gross sales and gross margins were down 
traffic count was down slightly, but the average ticket was up. And why was that? Well, the average ticket was reflective, of course, of the inflationary pressures, the increase in prices that we had uh, basically uh, implemented during the pandemic. So, you know, we're part of that inflationary pressure that we've seen, but it's been a good year, I mean, good uh, time period for us to increase our margins and to, um, <clears throat> you know, to actually fare pretty well for the most part. Again, 22 is not necessarily the best year. So it, it leads me to the, the next slide. Uh-oh, I don't know how I did that. <clears throat> now I just see myself again. Uh-oh. Okay, now, do you still see the slides? Now we do, yes. Okay, all right. I lost it there for a second. <laughs> all right, so what will be the impact uh, on the green industry going forward? What will impact the green industry the most? Well, obviously economic conditions, right? That's no surprise. And supply chain uh, and the availability of labor and the cost of labor, obviously a big, big deal, as well as the cost of other inputs and the housing market, what's it gonna be doing? and inflation followed by the likelihood of recession and then last but not least the response of the end consumer now over the next 39 minutes i'm going to be talking about these things right here so it's a big laundry list to cover so let's get started with that <clears throat> now the, here's a picture of gdp and you can see that in um, the fourth quarter last year gdp fell from the 3.6 or the 3.2 that it had had in, th in the third quarter. And while that was a decrease, the third and fourth quarter last year were much better than the first two quarters last year because they were both negative. And you already had folks saying, oh man, we're headed for a recession. Well, no other indicators were necessarily looking at that. There were, there were reasons why GDP was negative. Bounce back and then uh, fourth quarter 2.7. Most of the, the macroeconomic modelers at this point are projecting between one and a half to 2% in the first quarter of this year. We'll see, right? It's, there's, there's been some, some good economic data and there's been not, some not so good economic data. Now, there's a new, I, this year, I'm bringing in this particular uh, slide because I, I didn't have this slide before. The Census Bureau just released this data uh, they're this new index about a month ago. It's called the Index of Economic Activity. It's basically uh, an amalgam. Uh, it's a combination. I said I say amalgam. Uh, any whatever that word is. It's a combination of these 15 different metrics over here on the right hand side. And I'm not going to read all those, but obviously housing and manufacturing and and retail trade, all of those factors play into this index. Now, what's interesting about this index is that you've got uh, a lot of historically, you've got some variation in this index, but look at the pandemic period. There's a, a ton of variation, right? And which was reflective of the risk. Now, right now we're we're right about zero, which means we're we're kind of trucking along at the historic average, right? So a zero means the historic average, and you can see the variability on the upside and the downside uh, in recent times. So what about the supply chain though? All right, so if the, if the economy's not falling the heck in a handbasket, then what are the other factors that are affecting it? Well, the supply chain. And if you remember last year, <clears throat> I showed you a nice little pressure gauge that with multi multiple colors and it had green, red, and so forth. And prior to the pandemic, most of those indicators there were like 17 or 18 different indicators that have reflected the supply chain about how fast stuff was moving through the supply chain, the volumes that were moving, et cetera. And by and large, before the pandemic, they were mostly green. And then of course they were yellow and red during the pandemic and then mostly green starting in November, December last year. Well, I've got a different pressure gauge. This is put out by the New York Federal Reserve. And this uh, pressure gauge in, and also incorporates a number of the uh, indicators in the supply chain that, that reflect 
the cost of moving products through the supply chain as well as uh, the, the timing and the, the labor usage of labor, et cetera. And I want you to notice here on the right side of this slide, while you, you see the variability, it's all around zero and so forth, but look at the, you can see the pressure that the supply chain was under during the pandemic, but we're right there at the historic average right now. Being, what I mean by that is that <clears throat> many of the issues that we've had in the green industry in terms of the supply chain, there's a lot of those wrinkles are being ironed out or have been ironed out and we shouldn't see that much headwind in terms of the supply chain this year. The lead times for getting inputs have gone down. The cost at which those inputs is rising um, has, has been slowing. So, and I'll talk about that here in a second. So right now, that's pretty good news. I don't see the supply chain, Ceteris Paribus, you know, holding all of the things constant, and nothing's ever constant. So that's kind of a, an erroneous assumption on the part of we economists, but there's, you know, we, we didn't foresee Russia losing its mind in invading Ukraine. And we don't know what China is gonna do. So there's still some unknowns geopolitically. But by and large, the supply chain is starting to act relatively normal, albeit, let me just not show my slide for a second, show my webcam. The Let me make a point here is that when if you if you consider the supply chain, there's um, uh, a number of things that that we need to, to to keep in mind in the future is that the supply chain is de-risking itself. People are reshoring rather than offshoring. The um, the uh, we're, we're bringing things closer to home. We're finding multiple backup on our vendors and so forth. And so there's that de-risking the supply chain always costs us a little bit more in the short run but it provides a little better standing uh, to withstand shocks from any black swan events in the future. All right, let me go back to uh, my slides. There we go. Okay, uh, next slide with the labor availability and cost, all right? So I wish I had some better news. I simply don't have a lot of good news here. If you look at uh, labor availability, uh, the black line there is the number of jobs you know, we were up to 12 million jobs at some point. We were, we're down to 10 million jobs. The, the Federal Reserve, this decrease in the black line where my cursor is, um, that, that decrease has been caused by the Federal Reserve, of course, slowing down the economy. And that we've killed off several uh, million jobs, but there's, there's still some work to be done. The jobs report in January was incredulous given the circumstances. The, but there's some there's some good things happening. The blue part of this bar, the light part, these bars down here, the number of people quitting jobs. And this box right here, you don't have to read it now. Uh, I am going to make these slides available uh, to Farm Credit East, and you can get these slides through them if you if you um, uh, would like those. So you can take some time and study these a little bit close, a little more closely. But right now, this box says that it's the younger people that were quitting their jobs, and that that quit rate has been slowing down considerably, as well as the number of people that have been laid off because we need those workers. Unemployment rate again, redonkulously low, 3.4 percent. That's the the technical term, redonkulously. It's it's just mind blowing to be in the circumstance we are now at roughly around three and a half percent unemployment. The average hourly earnings, wages, this is not going down. This is year over year change. So while wages are still across the board increasing, they're increasing at a much, much slower rate than what they were before. But the cost to employers, you can see how it went up and spiked during the pandemic. It too has been easing. So this is the change from the prior quarter. This doesn't mean that wages are going down. It means that the, the rate at which wages are going up is declining. Now, this is non-farm wages. We know in agriculture, particularly the, the adverse effect wage rate kind of sets a floor for agricultural wages, including uh, those of us in horticulture. And of course, there's been no tie-in to the um, employment cost index that you see depicted here on the part of agriculture. 
which is part of the problem. The, the, the adverse effect wage rate is tied to the farm labor survey. And that farm labor survey is conducted by USDA. And of course, we've seen monumental increases in the adverse effect wage rate. And again, that tends to pull the wages up higher for most of the other people that you've got employed. And even if you don't use H2A workers uh, or H2B workers, those rates tend to be set at the wage rate, the prevailing wage rate in, in the area. So there's still an influence there. All right, now this is, this is a chart that I'm just showing you that there's not really a whole lot of relief in sight in terms of labor availability. Uh, this over on the left-hand side, you can see that the blue shaded portion is the baby boomers. And I'm, I'm on the tail end of baby boomers, just turned 60 last year, be 61 this year. And of course, we're retirement age. And there's an increasing number of baby boomers that are in retirement age. And in fact, during the pandemic, we had three times the number of retirements that we had normally have. And then we also had a jump, a spike in the number of new business applications. So go over here on the top right. Right during COVID, there are a number of people said, you know what? I don't necessarily, I didn't like my job before. This is a life-changing event. I've always wanted to do X, Y, Z. And by golly, they set off doing it. So a number of people started their own business. They hung out their shingle. But we know that there's two thirds of most small businesses fail in the first two years of being in business. So we're gonna see some of those people come back into the workforce. But the other big thing is that the way in which many people have continued their work has, has changed as well. If you look for the work from home, you can see the data there, 42% still say that they work at least uh, uh, part, portions of their job remotely. And you've got 15% that are some hybrid mix of being in person and remotely. So that's one of the reasons I say that I don't see a lot of relief in sight in terms of, of uh, labor availability. And the, the cost of that labor to the businesses, all right, there's going to be some corrections there. The jury's still out on the ag side, though. Now, the cost of inputs, uh, bring this slide back from last year because I calculate an index of prices paid by growers in the green industry and all the inputs that growers typically use are down here on the left in this column, um, you know, containers, media, labor, freight, et cetera. And I've got them weighted by their relative percentage of cost of goods sold, right? So the biggest portion of cost of goods sold is the 35% of cost of goods is labor. That's an average across nursery and greenhouse growers. And then I've got a, a, a model, a econometric model built for each one of these inputs in which I help, uh, I, I calculate this index and help folks understand how costs have changed year over year in the industry. So this is green industry stuff. I know the USDA calculates one for farmers and li livestock producers, et cetera, but this is, this is strictly green industry oriented. Now, in 2021, I had forecast 9.6% and it ended up around 10.1%. So I missed it by half a percentage point year over year. So inputs in 21 were 10.1% more expensive than they were in 2020. In 22, I, I had forecast 8.0%, so I'm getting better. I'm only four tenths of a percentage point off in terms of my forecast. It ended the end of the year at 8.4%. I had forecast uh, back last July a 3.6% uh, increase for 2023. And given the data that I have uh, to date, I can forecast that at about 3.5. So I, I was actually pretty close in terms of my forecast. We'll see how the year ends up because there's a whole lot of the year left, right? Now, my point is, you know, this is a very important slide because 10.1 plus 8.4, that's 18 and a half, plus three, three and a half, that adds up to 22%. All the growers online, if you haven't increased your prices over the last three years by 22%, you've been sharing margin with your customers. All right, so landscapers and retailers have also raise prices. I mentioned the average ticket for retail garden centers increasing, I think it was 5.2% or something like that. I don't remember the number right off the top of my head, 
but it was an increase in the average ticket size. Housing market, right? That's We're strongly correlated with housing. So let's take a look at that. Obviously, mortgage rates are heavily correlated with existing home and new home sales. As you see the orange line in these charts, that's the mortgage rates. We had a little bit of reprieve and then it hit it back up. I think 6.65% is the, the latest uh, quote I saw on mortgage rates, 30-year rates. And, you know, as rates go up, sales go down. It's, it's supply and demand. Yeah, here's some other data uh, on the right-hand side. Let's start on the right. This is Realtor.com data. This is newly listed homes. And you can see that there's been a decline of almost 16% year over year from February last year to February this year. There's been a decline in the home listings. Now, if you look on the left-hand side, that's the total listings are up 13.3% year over year. Well, how can that be, Charlie? Well, what's happening is that homes are listed and they're listed and they're listed and they're listed and they're not sold. So all these cumulative listings build up. So that's why I put the total listings and the newly listed data in here. But basically, we aren't buying and selling a lot of homes right now, which when those homes change hands, there's a lot of flower shrubs and trees and landscape services that are purchased that go around those homes. The average home value right now is going down. Um, the nominal prices, you can see that nominally, uh, the, the, the 328,000 is the, um, the price, the median price of homes right now. The red line is adjusted for inflation. That's the real value. And of course, today, the real value equals the nominal value. But you can see that the home prices have been going down, which, Okay, there's been a need for an adjustment. Why do I say that? Well, look right before the Great Recession. Look at the level of real prices, and then you account for inflation all this time period. Well, the housing market is higher than what it was when the bubble burst in the Great Recession. The, the, the housing bu the, the bubble had never been higher before then. We're higher than that now. So obviously there was a need for a correction, and that's what we're undergoing right now. And, and so home ownership rates are still right at about 66%. It was 66% uh, last month, 65.9, not a, not a big difference there. The, the, the reason that there's a trend away from home ownership is the rising real estate prices, right? And, and there's a limited supply of entry level homes for those millennials. Now, why don't I focus on millennials? because millennials now represent 38% of all home buying. Holy guacamole. So Charlie, you mean all those disparaging remarks we've said about millennials in terms of entitlement and everything? We're going to take that back. Yeah, that's exactly right, because our industry is, is quite dependent on millennials. Now, the good thing, and, and, and I, I say this in all sincerity, the good thing is that Millennials are mirroring some of their boomer parents and grandparents more so than Xers or, or the Z behind them. So there's 84 million strong in terms of millennials versus 78 million boomers. So while boomers built this industry, millennials are gonna be the one to save us or keep us going, uh, keep our momentum going over the future. Now, this is this is this chart right here. Man, if, I, this is probably the best news I have all day long, right? This this is housing starts annually. And you can see that housing starts since the Great Recession have been increasing, but housing starts have been declining uh, in 2022, right? Because, again, yeah, we're raising rates, right? There's then starts go down, existing home and new home sales go down. That's supply and demand. But look at this dotted line right here. 1.7 million units needed annually to meet the excess demand until 2030. Oh my goodness. I mean, talk about landscape services, talk about DIY uh, uh, landscaping, right? The flower, shrub and tree uh, uh, implementation or um, installation in, the, in landscapes, man alive. This is really good, right? So if we have this latent demand for housing, this is gonna help bolster the, the overall demand for our products and services. So I, I, 
I'm really bullish on the industry because of that. Now, what about this dadgum inflation that has been nagging at us and it seems to be so persistent and it's not transitory like j and others, including myself, thought early on that, that the, as soon as the supply chain wrinkles are, are, are gone, then inflation is going to go back to normal. Well, obviously, supply chain wasn't all the issue because, as we said earlier, supply chain's very close to what it was in terms of that pressure gauge and the performance in terms of the metrics that we were looking at. So, so the other half of that, though, is when you put five trillion. I mean, I'm going to back off. I'm going to click my webcam again, and hopefully you can see that. Nope, maybe. Nope. I don't think you're seeing my webcam, are you? Forget it. Now you don't need to see me. But here's the here's my point: is that the inflation um, has been rearing its ugly head. Only part of that has been explained by the supply chain. Anytime you put five trillion dollars of fiscal policies in place and put COVID relief monies in the hands of consumers, they're going to spend it. And then you put PPP monies and other in the in the pockets of businesses, they're going to invest it in, in one of three buckets, right? They're either going to um, invest in CapEx, they're going to invest in, in uh, paying down long-term debt, or they're going to build tradable assets, and build inventory. And I've seen a, a number of folks doing the last one and a little bit of the previous two as well. So if we talk about inflation, the this is the PCE index. I've got the CPI right after this, but this is what the Fed uses in terms of, of making its interest rate decisions. And you can see that the core is still uh, well above, two over 2% 2 above their 2% target. Now they have a range now that they typically are, are looking at rather than a strict 2%. But still, we're, we're well above that. And CPI, even though the consumer price index has been going down, last month it slowed considerably. I mean, there was a lot of great momentum there, and therefore you saw the 25 basis points that the FOMC made in terms of interest rates. And Jay Powell has kind of been signaling that in their meeting at the end of the month, they're they're likely to go with another at least 25 basis points, and I think that maybe as many as 50, depending on the economic data that comes in before that. So we're not done with this uh, inflation yet, but it is it is coming down. And this is this is kind of the effect. Remember, I said you put money in people's pockets, then sales go up. And we spent a bunch of money on on retail sales and buying durable goods and buying uh, lawn and landscape materials. <clears throat> Consumers did their part, right? 70% of GDP wrapped up in, in personal consumption expenditures. And folks did their, their part there. But then that's been tailing off. The last four months, retail sales have been declining, as you would expect during a correction period. The savings rate, uh, the saving rate, not savings, it's like, like daylight savings. That's, not, that's a misnomer. It's daylight saving time. And it's not personal savings rate, it's personal saving rate. So it's an adjective, not a noun. Anyway, be that as it may, the first round of stimulus checks, the second, the third, um, and we put, add all this injection of money, and of course the saving rate has been going down. Now speaking of savings, when you take a look at the, how wages have been increasing and, and expenditures have been decreasing, um, and how much is being paid from personal savings versus their wages, there's there's about 900 billion dollars worth of excess savings still in the pipeline on the household uh, balance sheet. So consumers still have money. They still have money to buy flower shrubs and trees. So I don't think it's going to be the lack of money. Now this was this was as of November last year. Now obviously they've spent down uh, a bunch of that in December for for Christmas. Even though many much of the Christmas season was was done by December. They people bought early in October and November, but January, February, uh, uh, the the weather was relatively mild, except for the the winter storms that we've seen over the last two weeks. In January, the weather was really mild compared to normal Januarys, and so the retail sales came in very favorably. 
And for our industry, again, um, we there there's parts of the country, Texas being one of those, right? It's where I'm at right now, where the season's already started, right? We've already kicked off and started shipping and so forth. So we're we're blowing and going, and um, and and folks have that money in which to spend, but are they going to spend it? That's uh, that's the key. Of course, the federal funds rate uh, has been going up. It's in the 4.5 to 4.7 range right now. We'll see whether at the end of the month, whether that uh, it's, that goes to another step level in the ladder here, right? So it's we had cheap money for so long. I don't I doubt whether we get back to these days anytime soon. Instead, we we will find some relief and we'll settle in uh, probably in the mid range for a, in 24 and 25. But all that will play out later, and I'll talk about that then. Now the recession that's that's impending. Because of the contraction, the slowing down of the of the the market that the Fed is trying to do, um, part of that they're they're using um, obviously monetary policy to try to pull that off, and using interest rates. Congress has got to do their part in terms of making sure they pass the debt ceiling and don't derail the whole system by by defaulting on our previous debt. So there's there's a number of things that are are affecting whether or not we're in recession. Now, when I, I wanna make sure everybody understands exactly where we're coming from here. It's not two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. That's the, that's the way that we used to think about that. Instead, the National Bureau of Economic Research now defines a recession as a significant decline in economic activity spread, spreading across the economy lasting more than a few months, right? So it's, it's a nebulous type of, of definition, but these are the six main uh, indicators that they look at in making that assessment. They look at how incomes are growing, the, the consumption rate, the manufacturing, housing, and so forth. The, all these indicators, which have been typically performing fairly well up until now. But what about Charlie's recession index? Now, for the green industry, I have my own dashboard that I look at uh, consistently. And there's there's more metrics than these, but the top ones, if I rank the top five, this would be it. I look at the four week moving average of unemployment claims. And generally in the past, we've seen a recession in and around, when they're around 400,000, that's when recession really starts to, to raise its ugly head. And we're half of that right now. So that's not really reflecting it. The Chicago Fed puts out another index that I really like, if it's zero, that means the historic average that the economy is, that's the kind of the, the average in which the economy has been growing historically, right? And so you've got these boundaries. So you click in this slide, the green line, green dotted line and the red dotted line. And typically recessions start when this index goes below that green dotted line. And while we are negative right now, we're growing at a slower rate than historically that the economy has, has grown historically, we're not down in that negative uh, 0.7 range to, toward the green line. And of course, expansionary periods, right, when it's above 0.7 uh, for more than a couple of years, that's generally when you see some inflationary times kick in. And of course, we, we were well above that for um, you know, a short period of time and right at that uh, and others. So that's why inflation it's been coming down, uh, but but it's not been coming down fast enough. Now there's a there's an economist at the Federal Reserve, uh, I think at the Cleveland office. I don't remember either St. Louis or Cleveland office. Christine Som, and she developed a model. And when the three month moving average of unemployment uh, increases by 0.5 percent within a given year, it's a rolling year, then that reflects recession. Well, this doesn't, right? It, look on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and there's not more than a half percentage difference. So that's not showing recession. If you look at the financial stress index that the St. Louis Fed calculates, there's a lot of variability right here. They're on the right-hand side of this chart during the pandemic, reflecting that risk levels are, are rising and falling, and there's more variability in this index. But still, it's below zero, and, and roughly around historic lows in terms of financial risk. It's, it's, uh, we're in a lot better shape than we were prior to the, the Great Recession. 
But there's two indicators that are causing some, some concern. The first is the yield curve. And then when you hear the media talk about the yield curve, they generally talk about the difference between 10-year treasuries and two-year notes. And, and of course, I don't prefer that one. Uh, some people look at the difference between 10-year notes and, um, and three-month T-bills. I don't prefer that one. I typically prefer the comparing the 10-year bonds to the, the federal funds rate, right? And, uh, and all of these are negative, right? And so it's when the, uh, the curve inverted and, um, and the federal, federal funds rate difference there went negative, that's when it caught my attention. The other metric that's catching my attention right now is the leading economic index. Remember, that's, that's an index of 10 different indicators rolled into one. And I, on this webinar in the past, I've said, if you're a grower, retailer, or landscaper out there, you should be following the leading economic index. That should be the one number you look at. If you only look at one number, this is the one to look at because it's a foretelling of the economy 11, 12 months down the road. And this leading economic index, you see these red lines the, and the black line there, that's, those are recession signals. And the leading economics uh, index crossed that recession signal. Now, while that's generally reflective that a, a recession is on its way, in the past, there hasn't been a lot of uh, forecasting power in that because of this. It generally, a recession st has started within three months to 18 months later after that occurred. So you can see, all right, we know that there's some sort of contraction coming, but we're not exactly, it's going to be somewhere between three months and 18 months from now. Well, all right, so that predictive power, it doesn't leave us a lot in terms of managerial decision-making, but we know that something is coming down the pike. So, and, and these are just three different pictures of that leading economic index. And, and again, once you, this, uh, if you take the six months average, right, and take out some of the seasonality, when it goes below this red dotted line there, this historic recession threshold, we're below that. So again, I'm just saying that this is pointing to the fact that there's likely going to be some sort of correction, and we're already seeing it, particularly on housing. We've seen it in manufacturing. Manufacturing's uh, been going through its own little recession for a while now. So there's different people that have different uh, feelings about whether a recession is on the way or not. You can see the New York Fed has a yield curve model, and right now they have a, they're putting about 57% probabilities on recession occurring this year. The Cleveland Fed's a little higher, about 63%. Wall Street Journal survey, they do about, they're about 61%. The Bloomberg survey of economists, um, I'm not in either one of those groups, but um, the, that they put about 70%. If you remember last year, I had this slide, but it's structured a little differently. And I said, there's about a 50-50 probability of recession occurring uh, before the, the next cultivate, right? Basically the middle of this year with the cultivate conference that American Hort puts on. So, I, and I said uh, back in November, December, when I, when I had this slide, um, I said, there's about a 90% probability of a downturn. Well, now I've, I've backed off on my percentage. If I had to put a percentage on it, I'd be closer to the 70, like the, in the Bloomberg survey. I'm just saying there's a high probability of a short-lived recession starting sometime mid to late this year. So if, if we do have one, it's gonna be relatively quick. Uh, it's, I say in the eight to nine month range, and then the Fed, uh, once those inflationary pressures starts, um, they start easing and, the, and the, um, it gets down to the, the target that they're looking at, they'll start lowering the federal funds rate again, kickstarting the system. And so they're looking to still uh, pull off a, um, a soft landing. They've only done it successfully about 40% of the time, but, but there is a chance. And a lot of it depends on that, that money supply as people spending on, from their savings continues to dwindle and more uh, spending is based off of their income increases might be able to navigate that a little bit. And so that's, that's, the 30% chance of not having recession if we do that successfully. But I still think 70% of my heart says that we're, we're likely gonna have 
sort of correction, but it's going to be a shorter, a shorter, uh, not, it won't be a two month correction like we saw during the pandemic, but it, it won't be as long as the great recession was for sure. Now, the last part, uh, the, the last response of the end consumer, right? So let me talk about the consumer here. I've got as many questions as I do answers. I'm, I'm really wondering in my mind right now, is the consumer going to pull back because of this inflationary um, the pressures on their budget? I don't think so because of the, the factors I just said, they've got uh, that the money in their uh, savings accounts uh, that they're, they're spending down. Uh, they're putting more money on plastic. If you look at the data, the, the how many expenditures are going on credit cards, it's increasing. So people are, are still spending right? We, we're creatures of habit, but we're, we're um, as, as those savings go down, again, if we make that switch and buy more on uh, our increased wages, then, you know, expenditures always rise to meet income. So I'm not too worried about the, the inflationary pressure. I think we'll get uh, the check on that. But are they going to spend more on loan and garden spending during the, re the next recession, this eight-month contraction that I'm because they're gonna be staying at home more? I don't know the answer to that exactly because during the pandemic, where they spent a whole lot on landscape services and flower shrubs and trees, are they gonna look outside and say, you know, I'm good? Or are they gonna continue this pattern, this trend of um, uh, spending that's above the long run average for the, the industry? And I, I didn't put that slide in this year, um, because there wasn't a much difference than, than uh, what there was last year. But I, again, I think they'll, ha they'll stay at home. Uh, they won't go to Disney as much. They won't travel as much, just like any other recession. But I don't know that they'll spend more on durable goods. And that means they don't have any money left for us because they spent so much during the pandemic. Anyway, uh, the next question has to do with did they pull their lawn and garden purchases forward in time? That is, they they spent some of what they would normally spend in 23, 24, and 25. Did they spend that during the pandemic in 21 and 22? And then they're good to go. I, I don't have a firm answer for that. Most of the surveys by Axiom and the National Gardening Survey, people are looking at 2023 and they're saying, yep, 80, 80, 8% of those new folks that engaged during the pandemic say they're going to buy as much or more in 2023. 80% of the existing gardeners and landscapers say they're going to spend as much or more in 2023. All right, well, that's good news. But that's what the heck they said in 2022 in the surveys then. And of course, Mother Nature trumped that particular stated, those stated preferences that that people were stating that they're likely to do do this, and of course people don't always say what they what, do what they say they're going to do, and we saw that because weather trumped everything. Now, will spending on affordable luxuries like plants return to trend, or is it going to we'll continue to see the increase in demand because of events? People they they so pent up the demand from for in person meetings. Is there's so much pent up demand and people, families and so forth meeting face to face. And of course, they always like to have uh, you know, flowers and shrubs around them during those events. And lastly, I don't, the housing market correction is going to go on and we're not going to see the precipitous decline in housing that we saw during the Great Recession, but there is going to be a correction. We're already seeing it. And how much of, of a drag is that going to be on the shrub and tree market? It's usually the tree growers uh, that, that and the tree sales that take it on the chin uh, during any uh, contraction uh, economically or, or in the particularly in the housing market. But then here recently, the the um, you know the sales have been strong. Are they going to continue being strong? That's the that's the big question. So that's that's it. That's that. Those are my comments. That's my last slide. I'll. I'll take that off and I'll turn my webcam back on. And Kyle was answering questions, if there were any that were addressed. Yeah, or, so just as a, 
reminder to everybody, you're feel free to text chat any questions in on that right side of your screen. There should be a question mark um, button. Uh, so we'll give it a minute or two. But I think the question I want to ask, Charlie, what is three yeah. takeaways from today that everybody can take back to their office, to their operation, to their farm? Yeah, yeah, good question. First of all, the supply chain is normalizing, so that's not going to be as big a headwind. Therefore, the the, the lead times in terms of purchasing inputs is improving, right? We don't have to buy next year's inputs this year and burn that working capital, which is what people have stockpiled last year and, and bought a lot of inputs. And so they're going to actually be better off this year because the cost of goods is going to be lower because they spent it last year. But they, they burned some of those return, retained earnings and the working capital doing that. But that doesn't mean that we've stopped in terms of seeing some input cost increases. So there's there's still going to be that that 3.5% pressure in terms of input cost increases across the board, right? And for containers, media, propagative materials, I mean all the the young plant growers, they're they're stay, they still implemented some price increases. Uh, many of those right now are seeing some cancellations and backing out of some of those pre-booked orders. So there's some adjustments being made in terms of inventory out there at the grower sector, and this will play out into the, the retail sector, the landscape sector. It may be for a good thing. Supply and demand, well, hopefully we won't oversupply the market in, in as quick a fashion as what we have historically. So that's that's one, all wrapped up in the supply chain and input costs, right? That's that, That's kind of that first area. The second area is that you've got inflation in housing. There is, we're in the midst of a, uh, of a correction in housing, but that correction is not going to sink the boat. It's, it's, we're going to see housing prices decline. We're seeing rental rates decline fairly dramatically because they were overpriced. So that correction is happening in both of those markets. Um, that's when the, a lot of things are tied to the mortgage rate. And as soon as the mortgage rate starts coming back down, we're going to see sales of, of new homes and existing homes go back up. Why? 1.7 million units in terms of latent demand that I showed earlier. Holy guacamole. That's, that's, that's incredible, right? And so that, that whole housing sector and the inflationary pressures uh, continue um, in terms of, or continuing to decline and, um, and so we won't see that appreciation in, in home values rise as quickly as what we did post Great Recession. And then that whole third area has got to do with the, you know, the spending power of, of consumers. And did we really influence the inelasticity demand on the part of consumers? Did we move the needle in terms of being considered a luxury good versus a necessity in people's lives? And one of the things, I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but it ties in right here, the consumer's ability to purchase. Yes, they have those excess savings, but it varies by age and it varies by income group as well. And most of the sweet spot for our lawn and garden consumer, are those between 45 and 65 and the main income earning years. And really, when you, when you look at about 53 to 63, it's kind of a you know, bell-shaped curve there, but that, that 45 to 65 is our sweet spot. And those folks are, are you know, like I said, there's 38% there's of, of the old, the older boomers are 43 years of age and they represent 38% of home buying. So there's some, there's some great tailwinds for us in terms of the capacity of the consumer to spend at those higher, mid to higher income groups. That's our base. Right, we typically don't sell a whole lot to lower income families. They've got enough on their plate in terms of, of surviving, but from middle to upper income families, that's our bread and butter, that spending power is still there. So that's, that's, that's the third uh, uh, element right there. Now I said a whole bunch of words in those three, but it's you know supply chain and, uh, and input cost, and then also the, the housing market correction and then the power of the consumer and, and then how inflation affects the, both of the housing and the consumer. So that, those are the, those are the short answer takeaways. <laughs> um, so 
what about um, data projections on C, uh, C, C, E, A, or controlled environment agriculture? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, the, the interest in uh, CEAs has been growing for the last decade. And there have been a number of people that have used CEAs for a number of different reasons, all the way from pharmaceuticals to, um, to growing food for, uh, uh, to combat food deserts in urbanized areas. And then also just as a as a uh, growing specialty type of both food and non-food items, um, the the demand for that those types of inputs in greenhouses has been bolstered by, of course, hemp and and uh, cannabis production, and that's that's put a little bit more demand on some of those uh, inputs greenhouses. Right, it's you it's you got to plan ahead if you want to build a new greenhouse these days because it'll take you longer to source everything and it'll take longer for the greenhouse manufacturer to to get everything to you and get the greenhouse built so there's there's um I, i'm talking all around that issue kyle because i don't know um it it appears even from a food security standpoint there's an interest in terms of of having a chunk of our food production in CEAs in a, in grown and produced instead of outside within a controlled environment, just from a food security standpoint. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of threats. I, I don't even want to say them out loud, but uh, we've had various types of, of terrorist type of events and, and some project that that may be uh, something that someone would want to do to us in the future. But from a food security standpoint, CEA has some tailwinds from a, a demand standpoint. There's some tailwinds. So, I mean, I don't deal a lot with the food side. It's mostly the ornamental side. So I, I think that's, I think I'll stop there rather than go out on a limb too much. Yeah. So I think that takes care of all the questions that we had come in, Charlie. So again, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk about the uh, green industry with us this afternoon. Um, so with that, uh, just a final reminder to everybody, our webinars past, present, and future will be at farmcreditist.com forward slash webinars, as well as our YouTube channel. Um, we do have several coming up, including one about the maple industry uh, next week, and then also our fishing industry one will be uh, the first week in April. So again, Charlie, thanks for having uh, being with us today and hope uh, hope all is well and you'll have a great afternoon. You're welcome, Kyle, and thanks for the invitation.